what hap would happen to you if internet broke down? What would you do? Yeah. That would be a catastrophe for you. You will get so depressed that uh, nothing can really help you. But of course that holds for me as well. I shouldn't be... I shouldn't... <laughs> Okay, let's uh, keep on. Sub question E: Consumer and uh, consumer and producer surplus are important in microeconomics. Define and explain these terms. First, then we have to define them, and then we have to explain them. So there are kind of two answers needed to perform correctly on sub-question E. Consumer surplus can be found as the area spanned by under the demand curve and over the price line. Okay, yes? Uh, in these answers, can you, have, uh, can you show it by pictures? Yes, of course you can. If you are Definitely. Okay. So you can say, okay, if this is the supply curve, this is the demand curve, and this is the price, then this means something. Consumer surplus, this means something else. Producer surplus. Okay? That's the definition. And then the explanation. Why is this interesting and what does it mean? Let's have a look at what I write here. Consumer and producer surplus may be defined as the area between the hori horizontal line for a given market price and the demand curve. Consumer surplus and between the same line and the supply curve, producer surplus. The explanation is straightforward. A given point on the demand curve may be interpreted as the willingness to pay for a certain good by a consumer or a group of consumers. Given a market price below this willingness to pay, the consumer earns a profit. Okay, they have to pay less than they are willing to pay. The total area is then the aggregated or the total consumer profits or surplus. Similarly, the point on the supply curve is, as we have seen, a marginal cost of production. We discussed that in the course, didn't we? Selling the product for a price above this marginal cost creates a profit for the sup supplier. And the total aggregate area aggregates all this profit up to the producer surplus. So the consumer surplus is a kind of total profit ending up in the pockets of the consumers as a consequence of buying a certain product at a given price, P. Similarly, the sur producer surplus is the what fills the pocket of the supplier or the producer here in the same situation. We could say the kind of division between what the consumers get and the producers get. Okay, that was question E. F, fine consumer uh, and producer surplus for the market described by equations two and one. Okay, we have these equations. Uh, and then of course we need to find these two areas. We have our figure already, don't we? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, here it's uh, here. So we want to find area, area of this triangle here and this bigger triangle down there. So the producers are happier in this situation, if you like. Uh, the shape of the demand curve produces a relatively small consumer surplus here. Typically, the more horizontal-like the demand curve is, the less consumer surplus is generated. If it's perfectly horizontal, consumer surplus is zero, isn't it? The same for the supply curve is that is very little steepness in it. No. Ah. Okay, who cares? Um, let's go back to the solution. Um, in figure two, the green triangle marks the consumer surplus, while the yellow one marks the producer surplus. 
and here we have things correctly in a sense uh, at least almost 0 50 100 okay given this information is straightforward to compute the surpluses cs denotes consumer surplus while ps denotes producer surplus so cs is found by finding this distance here and this point we already know is 90.9091 don't we we found that point previously as the market price so 100 minus 90.9 produces that distance and then you have to multiply it with that distance which is 10 in the figure isn't it or actually 9.0909 to be precise and to find the area of a triangle we take the height multiply it with the baseline and divide by 2 that turns out to be 45 point something in this case and on the other hand for the producer surplus the distance here increases turns to be 90.91 doesn't it multiplied by 9.09.9 divided by 2 and that turns out to be 413.2228 again bad numbers okay but you see as we saw from the figure that this one is much smaller than that one why does this thing come up all the time and how do I get rid of it Obviously, the producer surplus is far larger than the consumer surplus, so producers ought to be far more happy with this market than consumers. That was uh, my uh, suggested answer to sub question F. It's not necessary, but it's. Uh, It says find consumer and producer surplus. I would interpret that, that that we're looking for the numerical values as well. But of course, you, you might as well add a figure to show what it means. That's, uh, that's not bad. So this was a perfectly competitive market. Now we move to sub, sub question G. Assume alternatively that the producer in this market is a monopolist. What information is missing in the exercise text in order to find monopoly price, quantity, and profit? What information do we need in addition to the information we have in the text in order to find the monopoly solution? We have the demand and the supply curve, don't we? Let's see what the solution says here. In order to solve the monopoly problem, we either need a full fetch formulation of the monopoly profit or go, go directly to the formula marginal revenue equals marginal cost. As the market demand curve is present, marginal revenue MR can be derived easily as the derivative of the revenue curve. This is the, the demand curve times quantity, and the derivative of that, which is 100, times 100 minus 2Q, is the marginal revenue curve. Then the question of whether marginal costs are available must be answered. Okay? In this case, they are not. Surely, the supply curve contains information on marginal costs. But the original information does not contain mar marginal cost information for a single monopolist. Okay, remember that. When you look at a perfectly competitive market, it's correct that the supply curve is a part of the marginal cost curve, but it's a part of the marginal cost curve for an infinite amount of producers. Okay? And we have no information on that infinite amount, do we? We just have the supply curve. You remember, we, the first thing we did was kind of find and argue that the marginal cost curve for a single producer or above a certain point is the supply curve. But next, we had to add together all these marginal cost curves to get the market supply curve. We don't have anything but the market supply curve here. We don't have the other way around. We don't, we don't have any means to disaggregate this marginal cost or supply curve. So even though we have the supply curve in the industry or in the market here, we do not have it for this single producer. Now if you think back about the previous exercise, you may maybe find some something to think about there. Okay. So we lack marginal cost information for the monopolist in order to solve the problem. Then 
in H. Derive expressions for the optimal price, quantity, and profit for these monopolies as a function of the missing parameters. Okay, now we have identified a missing parameter here, the marginal cost. Let's call that something, and then produce some math where that something is a function uh, functional related to, to these unknown marginal costs. That is straightforwardly how the intention was. I don't think any student actually ab were able to do it, but it doesn't really matter. Um, of course, we start by marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We have the marginal revenue curve, looks like this, but then we just put in something for the marginal cost. We can call it A or B or, or Peter or Jane or whatever you like. I call it MC here to denote that it's marginal cost. And then, of course, I can compute the optimal quantity by solving this equation with respect to QM star, where MC is a parameter. Then it turns out to be 100 minus MC halves by this simple equation here. Then, of course, I can enter it into the demand curve to find the price, can't I? I have the, the demand curve as PM equals to 100 minus Q, uh, as given in the exercise, and then I have the quantity by equation 4, and I just put that quantity into this equation instead of Q star to get an expression for the monopoly price. So the monopoly price turns out to be 100 plus MC halves. Okay, so it's like that. The optimal profit, however, is slightly more complex, isn't it? If we want to express this as a function of marginal cost, then we need to know how to come from marginal cost to total cost. We know the other way around, don't we? We take the derivative of the total cost to get to the marginal cost. And uh, this is something I didn't expect. Uh, sometimes I give something on exam that I don't expect anyone to know, okay? But in order to do that transformation, <coughs> if somebody turned out to know this, then of course they, they should be happy, okay? We know that if we have a total cost function, okay? Then we can find the marginal cost by taking the derivative of this one. Okay. In our formulas, we have used the marginal cost. The question is, how do we come from the marginal cost to the total cost? Then we need to know that the opposite operation of differentiation is integration. Have anybody of you learned about that? Do you know the answer of this one? Anybody know the answer of this one? You haven't seen it before? You have seen it? Yeah. And the answer is a half times x squared, isn't it? Because if I take the derivative of this one, I get that one back. So it's the opposite operation of differentiation. That's integration, okay? So if we want to go from this one up to there, then we have to, to do something like this then. Actually, but uh, I didn't expect anybody to know that, that anyway. So that's the reason for what's following here, okay? If you think this looks complicated, it's really not that complicated. Of course, nobody was able to do that, but it doesn't matter, okay? It didn't affect any grades, so to speak. Sometimes you can learn something from an exam, okay? Not only handling your own uh, ner ner nervousness, but maybe you can even learn some topics. Okay, that concludes exercise one. That was 60% of the exam. If you look at it, I would say that up and including F, everybody should be able to do everything almost correct. And that should always always be 50%. So everybody passed. Okay. You see that? Yeah. Okay. So it's gonna be the same. No, it's not gonna be the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be totally totally different. Okay. You see this one starts with uh, uh, this uh, first exercise starts with perfectly competitive and with monopoly. Maybe you should turn it around. Start with monopoly and with perfectly competitive, okay? Maybe some different numbers, maybe some different settings, that, uh, something like that, okay? Sometimes I can give you something and ask you to explain it. Maybe I can give you some equations, say what does this mean, and so on, okay? So, there is still time left, yes. Exercise two. Here, 
there are a set of equations. Okay, first there is max u equals to u of x y equation three subject to p x x plus p y y equals i equation four. And then there's something else there minimize c equals to w l plus r k subject to f o k l equals to q bar equations five and six. And finally equ equation seven max p o q equals to p q minus c q. And then it says equations 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 define three important optimization problems in microeconomics. Explain the contents of each of these problems, including parameters, objective functions, and constraints. Objective function is what we want to maximize, okay, in case I didn't tell you that. Constraints are what are we put after this subject to, kind of constraints our problems. So this one is unconstrained, this one is constrained, and this one is constrained. Why are they, meaning the problems, needed? What do we use these problems for, so to speak? So we should explain. This one is a utility maximization problem, isn't it? We have a, a utility function here. We have it subject to a budget constraint. Then presumably Px is the price of a good x. Py is the price of a good u. Not u, y. And i is the budget constraint. Okay, that's the explanation of the first one. The second one is a cost minimization problem, a part of our production theory. Not the final part, which comes in seven, but a midpoint. And the idea here is to find the correct amounts of labor and capital such that the cost we spend on capital and labor is minimized given our production environment which is described by this f o k l, which we call a production function. And this q bar here is a kind of running amount, which ends up producing a total cost function. That's a function of q. The final problem is a profit maximization problem, which is the final part of production theory, where p is given price taking, q is the amount, and c o q is the total cost, so this is revenue here, cost here, and profit to the difference between them. That was an explanation of A. Why are they the problems needed? This one is needed to derive demand curves, isn't it? We use these construct by looking at one product, changing the price, resolving that optimization problem many times, and for each time we do that for a new price, we get a new quantity. Then we get the link between price and quantity on the consumer side. Again here, we repeatedly solve this problem for different values of this Q bar to produce finally a total cost function as a function of Q, the number of units produced. This one is the final point in establishing the supply curve, isn't it? By solving that optimization problem, we find that price equals marginal cost. The derivative of this one is price. The derivative of that one is marginal cost. So equating to zero produces price equal to marginal cost. And then we did an argument on picking certain parts of this marginal cost, naming that a supply curve. So the first problem is needed to derive the demand curve. The two second problems are needed to derive the supply curve. That's why we need these problems. And that's the kind of answer I would like you to give on that exercise. Pick two of the problems and draw figures illustrating the solution process. Yeah, what I'm, uh, yeah, we can look at the solution here. It is, it's of course, up to you where, what, which two you pick. Did I make any graphs here? No, I was lazy. Okay. What does it say here? If we pick the two first problems, graphical solution strategies should be straightforwardly explained in the textbooks. For instance, in figure 313, page 86, and in figure 73, page 256. You probably remember these, don't you? That this utility maximization problem, you had the budget constraint, and then you had these difference curves, and this point was the solution. There were similar graphical representations of this second problem, so you can that if you like. 
this final problem can of course also be kind of visualized very easily actually this is the profit function here is q star okay that produces the optimal profit or if you like you can draw a demand curve here price and marginal cost here and say this is the solution okay so there's a lot of options here up to you okay on how to visualize these solutions uh, that was all actually here you were not asked to solve any of these problems with mathematics Okay, exercise two. This exercise has obviously a lot of possible sensible solutions. No, this was the solution. We have to look at the exercise. Uh, make your comments to the following allegation. Do you find it correct, wrong, or perhaps somewhere in between? Sports and event markets are especially bad suited for applying the perfectly competitive equilibrium model. The fact that sport and event markets contain large amounts of asymmetric information indicate that equating supply and demand must prove incorrect solutions. The fact that football leagues contain a limited amount of teams, not producing a homogeneous product, stress this fact. Not to speak about event markets where most producers may be viewed as local monopolies. As such, a monopoly model must be better suited in order to analyze sport and event markets. So you here you write something, some sentences, okay, trying to comment on this, trying to look at the different allegations here, could they be right or wrong and so on, okay. What we can say in general, of course, is that we don't know the answer to this because we haven't looked at the theory. We know that reality is somewhere in between normally a monopoly and a perfectly competitive setting. The question could can then be whether sport and event markets are closer to a monopoly than to perfectly competitive situations, but the answer to that is that we cannot say that either, because this depends. Okay? We can, from a practical point of, of view, say that, okay, we, we, we have a feeling that these sport and event markets perhaps resembles monopolies more, but it's a long way from saying that to kind of uh, deducting that that uh, the solutions in the monopoly model fits better. That's not not given. So uh, we can look at the solution here, perhaps, and see what I write. This exercise has obviously a lot of possible sensible solutions. The fact that sport and event markets in general perhaps do does that's correct, isn't it? The fact that sport and event markets do in general perhaps do not fit very well to the assumptions outlined in a perfectly competitive equilibrium model does not necessarily mean that a monopoly model is the solution, okay? That's what I kind of tried to say previously. The strict assumption on a single producer is, of course, seldom present, even in most event and sports markets. The fact that price-taking behavior is seen seldom does not necessarily mean that monopoly pricing is immediately available in search markets. There's a difference between using a, a stringent monopoly model to find the price, uh, there's difference between that and actually using a price making behavior. Okay, it doesn't mean the same, although you kind of fix the set the price yourself. Of course, when the local football club here announces uh, seats for the next match, they are in full charge of the prices, so they can they can set the prices. Nobody else can set them, so they have the price making opportunity. Whether a monopoly model is the correct one to use is quite a different story. On the contrary, it's perhaps reasonable to assume market forms in between these two extremes, though such market forms are not discussed extensively in this course. Okay? They are not discussed at all, actually. We haven't discussed game theory at all here in this course. The reason for that is that I know that it will come in the next course. Okay? So instead of bothering you with even more things you don't understand, we leave that to the next teacher. Okay? So, we have finished the curriculum in the textbook. We have looked at all the exercises, we have looked at last year's exam, there's nothing left. So my suggestion is the following, we go home now, you go home, you, you, you s think a little bit until tomorrow on whether you have any questions, and then you show up here tomorrow morning. If you don't show up here, you can show up in my office at any time you like, and ask me questions. Okay? There's still a lot of time till the exam, today is the 6th, isn't it? Yeah. The exam is the 21st. This is 21 minus 6, that's 15 days, isn't it? Two weeks. So you have a lot of time. But uh, do not wait until there's one day left, okay? Try to spend some time preparing for the exam. That is always a good idea. 
And then I wish you luck. It could happen that some, none of you shows up tomorrow morning in that case. I wish you luck for the exam. Okay. And of course, with um, some of you, I will meet again next year, I think.